the elephant is like gold. You can call it a near person, essentially because it's very, very similar to humans. Very similar. Their social structure, the kind of bonds they form with their kin and kith, and the kind of abilities that they have to communicate, it's extraordinary. It's also called the natural heritage animal of India. It's a species that has perhaps done so much to the humankind. So the elephant is perhaps an anecdote of life. It's a symbolic expression of how a life form should exist, in all the true sense. See, my name is Avinash Krishna. I currently work as a director for science and conservation and also double in as a CEO of Arusha India, which is a unit of an international organization based in 23 countries. My work has largely to do with uh, science and conservation, with a key emphasis on human-wildlife interactions uh, in the Eastern Ghat landscape, which is pretty much in the states of Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. I remember my journey began uh, as a volunteer in, in association with Arusha India, which is, which is the organization I currently head, in the capacity of a volunteer researcher in, in an elephant project which focused on enumerating populations in, in, in these landscapes, especially the Banagata National Park. See, for me, elephant uh, it obviously was a chance factor, not something that I was, that was a choice. It's not, not a species that I decided to work on, although I had interest in wildlife in general, but I was not very species specific when I started off. So this encounter with elephants happened in my formative years in my, field, in, in my career in wildlife sciences, wherein I participated in this enumeration exercise, which essentially counted elephants in, uh, in all over the country, but it was specific to this task uh, in southern India in Banagata National Park. So I got this opportunity to try and understand various field techniques, various methods in which one would employ, and, and these were statutory processes in which the government of India followed across the country. It started off like that and then it eventually went on to being part of the organization in various capacities. The next project that I uh, contributed in the same organization as a volunteer was to essentially understand human wildlife conflict mitigation, which back then we were doing a project on using social barriers to uh, mitigate human health and conflict. So I spent six, seven months in that project collecting field data, working with the local communities that were affected by crop depredations that were caused by elephants. And it went on to uh, continue with various other conservation projects such as biodiversity enumeration, looking at habitat quality, uh, trying to work with grassroots communities in developing certain livelihood options. And I decided that I'd like to pursue the science aspect of conservation, which back then was very underlooked. And at some point I realized that my experience that was gained was fairly large from elephants, working in southern India almost. So I decided to pursue a more focused approach in contributing to elephant conservation because even till now there are several threats and challenges that influence the survival of that species. Elephants are very important species, not just because of not, not just limited to the fact that they're a very cultural animal. It has several uh, synonymous uh, relationships with mankind. It's one species that has had nearly close to 2,000 years of association with the humankind. But apart from that, from an ecological standpoint, it is a keystone species and a species that significantly contributes to the ecosystem in which it lives in, especially in a very important aspect of seed dispersal. Like at least if you look at in southern India, and especially in optimal forests where elephants are found, they're directly contributing to about 60 to 65 species of plants in their dispersal aspects. So if, if elephants were not there, then those 65 species of plants will not be able to disperse. And uh, we also popularly call them as gardeners of the forest, essentially because of the fact that they, you know, help in creating gaps in vegetation as part of their foraging routines. They're able to open up canopy to ensure that the light penetrates onto the ground, which also facilitates regeneration of many other species, host of plant species. They're also important in creating microhabitats, like if you see in elephant landscapes especially, you see in elephants you know, creating a lot of mud puddles, water pools, unearthing the soil and creating more uh, water flow. So through these kind of um, involuntary actions by the elephant, there is a host of other low taxonomic groups like frogs, butterflies, get great opportunity to continue the discourse 
in that sense. So in keeping all these aspects purely, I mean, stressing more on the ecological aspect, I think the elephant is very important to ensure that our forests can thrive in this country. See, my work has largely been on the issue of human-elephant conflict, if, I'm, if I say it like that. The human-elephant conflict is a problem that has directly uh, influenced the survival of the species. Like in this country alone, if you look, there are about 500 people, about four, uh, 250 elephants and about 1 million hectares of land, about 500 families are directly affected by this issue of human-elephant conflict. It is definitely a massive concern. So if you look at the 21st century issue, human-elephant conflict directly poses a threat to the species. So in that sense, my work has been essentially to try and do my bit uh, from an organizational standpoint to address human health and conflict using a multi-dimensional approach. So like I mentioned, the statistics that, you know, since human health and conflict is affecting so many different aspects of not just the species, but also human life, we obviously need to use a multi-dimensional approach in addressing this problem. So my focus uh, is that and will continue to be that as long as we are able to make some tangible outcomes in mitigating the problem. I started off my work in the Eastern Ghats and of course it continues to be mine and our focal area of conservation largely because it's a very ignored landscape. And also from the fact of climate, it also offers a very salubrious climate for, for people to reside. So if you see in terms of human density, I mean, this area, this portion of the Eastern Ghats is fairly dense and it, it, it's probably co contributing to the livelihoods of many, many people. It has about five, six rivers that originate from this region. So therefore, from an ecological and from a societal standpoint, it's an important biome. Conservation is a very broad category of initiatives that are employed generally to address various aspects about what is required, especially if you look at elephants. So in the scientific approach, we use methods, uh, approaches wherein uh, they are ro scientifically robust in terms of enumerating population because it's important to understand in a given area or a given zone, how many elephants are there and what kind of implications that population has. So, so we do a lot of enumeration exercises at an annual scale. We also conduct various surveys, baseline surveys, to try and uh, understand the importance of uh, causal factors for conflict, which could be looking at structural fencing, it could be uh, parameters in habitat use, uh, dispersal trends, multiple aspects. So we have, we have employed different sets of uh, methods and approaches in order to assess the needs of the problem, that's one. Now on the other aspect, apart from science, we also look at a lot of education and communal models, essentially to create awareness and sensitization. And we also employ a lot of training and capacity building tools in trying to involve the stakeholders, uh, especially in an aspect like human elephant conflict, to try and bring holistic results and tangible outcomes to address the conservation need of elephants. The, the most common method is what is prescribed by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. There's a division called Project Elephant. So they involve something known as the direct count method and the indirect count method. The direct count method primarily involves identifying elephants and classifying them based on the age and sex structure or what we call as age-sex compositions. The indirect method is to try and use indirect evidence of elephants, which the most reliable indirect evidence of elephant is the dung, the, what it defecates. So we use the elephant dung to try and interpret density from that. So these are two robust, fairly robust methods that the government of India, since the establishment of Project Elephant in 1993, have been using over a five, five year period to try and assess the population numbers of elephants. Now, in order to compound that, we also use something that's more robust using camera traps to try and look at occupancy framework models to try and assess elephant presence and absence in certain areas. We do individual mark and recapture, mark recapture methods where we make individual profiles of elephants to try and compare them and see their trends at an annual scale, especially from a conflict standpoint to understand which elephants are occupying which area at a certain point of time. So these are different ways in which we we study elephants, uh, at least in this landscape where we work. Yeah, elephants, I always keep saying they're more or less, more or less like us. So right? like everyone else has personalities, they also have morphological features that can be individually identified. One major challenge is the lack of knowledge. The, the lack of knowledge that compounds to making decisions that are not favorable to the conservation of elephants. This is not just limited to the forest department whose mandate is to protect wildlife and forests, but it also extends to various line agencies. It can be the 
highway department, it can be the irrigation department, it can be the agriculture. So all these people have to come together to try and address elephants because with elephants, what we realize, like I said, they're just like people, they have long standing implications. So even today, some of the threats that we are facing are not something that we have imposed. It's something that we are inheriting over a period of time. And some of them can be reversed. And what essentially that means is that we need to have a more cooperative effort towards working uh, in favor of elephants as well as conservation. Policymakers are largely a reflection of society. So the society is what defines policy and administration and governance. So I think it's the need of the society that needs to be put forth in a very sensible and that way I feel science can really help in contributing in, towards the right information. That's number one. The second aspect of it is to make policy more holistic rather than more reactive. So in the case of elephant and elephant conservation, I think we need to look at more proactive policies that are more long term and futuristic rather than that is more temporary and short term. Right? So because if if you look at the issues currently, we've We've experienced conflict for many years, at least in documented history, we have close to about four or five decades of documented history of human-elephant conflict. And we've still not been able to address uh, conflict in a very holistic sense. So therefore, we need to look at a more focused approach rather than a more generic way of doing it. The elephant has a very important keystone value in the forest. So if these forests deplete and if, if change in land use and land cover exacerbates at, at the rate at which it's going, then it'll definitely have influences on elephants as well and the roles that they play as ecosystem engineers and the services that they provide. Climate change needs to be integrated in, in conservation practices as well as policies to try and look at uh, solutions on the long term. And the most important fact about climate change is that, that it's globally known that climate change is going to affect people who are in the low economic strata. People who are in the strata, especially in the agrarian sector, who again are affected by elephants. So climate change compounded with human-elephant conflict is going to have disastrous impacts on the agrarian economy of this country. It's because sometimes we end up prioritizing needs of people more than wildlife, but unfortunately it should be the same. In cases of wildlife and forests, they have direct benefits for the survival of, of people, right? So that way I think planning and working in coordination and cooperation with with various stakeholders because generally the notion is that the elephant or wildlife is the mandate of only one department which is the forest department but the benefits of what these wildlife and forests are actually contributing is several so therefore when you're planning something in a elephant landscape or in an elephant forest that also has people i think we need to account for the needs of people as well as elephants in tandem they have to go hand in hand and only when you do that will you have a more robust management mechanisms for conservation or for elephants. Some of the problems that we inherit now are not the problem of this generation. So it clearly shows that with a species like the elephant, which lives as long as us, it's essential that we look at futuristic problem solving rather than looking at a very temporary action. If you're in an elephant landscape or if you decide to reside in an elephant landscape, you need to be willful about the choices that you make in terms of the acreage of land, the houses that you build, the kind of crops that you cultivate, all this needs to be taken into account. This is not something that, of course, policies can be uh, essential in driving these decisions, but it can also be a community will. People should be sensible and tolerant enough to understand these aspects. Human-elephant conflict is not experienced by the urban elite. Unfortunately, the voiceful society is that. People who are the ones who are vouching for conservation and advocating conservation are the people who are seldom affected by something known as human elephant conflict. There's a divide in terms of perception, in terms of attitude, where the urban population ends up viewing the, the rural population as to be a more an intolerant society. The forest today and the wildlife today that we have is not actually as a result of good policy only, but it's also because of these kind of communities who are far more understanding of the ecosystem and much more resilient about certain changes in the environment. So this divide largely sets in a notion that intolerance is at a highest level, but it's actually not. When a farmer who is experiencing human health and conflict, he has absolute right to express his angst against, you know, elephants coming in, you know, causing crop damage, which directly affects his livelihood, in some cases even his life. So I would consider that a willful expression of right to life and right to livelihood, which is a constitutional mandate. So I don't think that we need to view it in that capacity, right? I mean, it's essential that we need to bring in the attitudes and perceptions to a very uniform understanding, right? People from 
different socio-economic groups or socio-economic classes should be able to look at an issue in a very holistic sense and not in a very biased aspect. So I think this whole narrative of saying certain people are intolerant because they live close to forests and they're cultivating, it's not correct is what I feel. I'm not just saying people, urban people, but I'm also saying a lot of conservation practitioners as well as policy makers as well. So that kind of ignorance should be avoided and changed. The elephant, firstly, is not an animal that you can live with, all right? It's not an animal that you can have it in your backyard and, you know, enjoy its beauty, right? It's an animal that is potentially dangerous, it can kill you. Right? So I don't think so any person on this planet would be happy to live with elephants. And in case of agrarian people, they are affected by it. Their lives are affected, their livelihoods are affected. And that is the direct thing that we measure. We don't look at so many hidden things that go beyond that, right? The fact that if you're crop guarding, for instance, you know that the elephant is going to come today. There are sleepless nights. The farmer who is trying to guard his first crop in the, of the season is going to sit up a uh, machan, uh, probably at a higher vantage point, and ensure that the elephants don't come. There could be five days that the elephant doesn't come, and it could be probably the sixth day that it comes. But in the, in the period of six days, he's lost a lot of sleep deprivation. So that results in a lot of social and you know civic issues where he goes back home, a lot of psychological stress, just to try and be able to do what they have to do in order to earn their livelihood. So these hidden costs of conflict are never measured. We are only looking at you know crop damage, loss of life, compensation, excretion, all of that. We are not accounting for a lot of hidden costs that could affect lives and livelihoods of people, which is paramount. If you look at the country of India, we have about, roughly about 27,000 elephants, right? Now, this 27,000 elephants, like I keep saying, is obviously because of a conservation success, right? We started off with a number which is probably not, not as much as what it is now, and especially when they live in most of these protected areas, with increased protection, the populations go up, and an elephant, like a species like an elephant is an excellent breeder, they breed well. Um, so therefore, I think local population explosions are also something that, that needs to be managed from an elephant standpoint because of the fact that when numbers increase and the area doesn't increase, the elephants can eat themselves. Right? Uh, elephants need large, undisturbed, vast tracts of forest for them to procreate and for, for them to be the species that they are. But if you do not provide habitats, but just have numbers, then that's also impacting elephant lives. Like even if you look at human-elephant conflict, you have most of the elephants that contribute to conflict are essentially bulls, which is probably because of their behavioral propensities, they engage in more conflict compared to others. And on the other side, most of the elephants that die because of conflict are also male elephants, bulls. Now, if you look at the population structure of elephants, male elephants, adult male elephants, con contribute roughly to 15 to 20 percent of the population of elephants. So if you're losing about 15 to 20 percent of the breeding population of male elephants in, in, in a given ecosystem, then you're essentially looking at a population collapse, right? So this is a direct way in which elephants can be affected on the long term. I don't know if I'll be able to achieve anything in my lifetime because considering the fact that these, these I inherit these problems for many years, so I'll probably, probably contribute to resolving most of them, at least as long as I'm able to contribute to the conservation of Eastern Ghats as well as its elephants. I think firstly, to, firstly is to probably set a premise as to what needs to be done for conservation in a very uh, uh, adaptable, in a very uh, useful manner for various stakeholders. That would be one of the more key ways of looking at conservation. In some sense of es establishing a roadmap for conservation principles. And of course, science is one aspect of it, but we need to develop more ways in which, for instance, using technology, using social media, using several different tools in which that can engage with communities and the people who are responsible in conservation and make them aware of what their responsibilities are. And the other thing is to try and stop certain uh, decision making, especially at a policy level, that has a direct influence on elephants and elephant habitats. So try and contribute to policy in a sense where we, we are not allowing certain Detrimental activities, especially like roadways, railways, irrigation canals, coming in already disturbed tracks in the Eastern Ghats, because Eastern Ghats, like I mentioned, is a very highly human-dominated, fragile ecosystem. And to have more of development that is unplanned and unmanaged, I'm not against development, but if it's unplanned keeping species, especially like the elephant, not keeping species like the elephant in mind, could have disaster effects. So therefore, contributing to change that way is pivotal. There's a nice book called Elephant Gold by a former British colonial forester. He says that the elephant is like gold. 
is a species that has per perhaps done so much to to the human kind uh, in several like if you if you go back to the warfare right the elephants have fought up like for instance Aurangzeb had about 40,000 elephants in his elephant army if you talk about the elephant in Myanmar and the, the southeast frontier the kind of contributions it did to the timber logging industry and of course the elephant that is paraded and believed and worshipped as the embodiment of Lord Ganesh so the elephant in that sense is perhaps an anecdote of life right? it, it's, an, it's a symbolic expression of how a life form should exist in, in, in all its true sense. So that way for me, the animal, of course, has made me realize from a very intrinsic standpoint about what commitment is, about what wisdom is, about what pursuit is, what resilience is. So for me, it's more than what I study, it's something that I relate to, right? It's something that I kind of build my own identity through the animal. So that way I think uh, it's, it's a people's animal and I think people subscribe to it.